Nikki, and uh, I'm joined by Eric Brynjolfsson, Director, MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and Professor at the MIT Sloan School. Eric will be speaking broadly today on what advances in machine learning mean for firm level processes and the effects on human labor and productivity. Thank you, Eric, for your time. It's a pleasure to be here, Nikki. Eric, uh, first of all, you've said success doesn't accrue uh, to those with the best products or the best understanding of strategy. Yes. And can you elaborate on this? What are those small decisions that they make which make co some companies great? Sure. Well, I would say it doesn't always accrue to them. Certainly, it's helpful to to make, uh, have the best products and the best strategy. But it's also important to understand that there are often a lot of small circumstances that could tilt the playing field one way or the other. I mean, for instance, uh, let's take the case of social networking. Um, it makes sense for us all or most of us to use the same social network so I can share pictures with my brother and my mother and my friends and my high school friends. Um, and if we were on different networks, we couldn't do that. So there tends to be one dominant one. There, in other words, there are very strong network effects. Now, early on, maybe in the early 2000s, there were multiple social networks, maybe dozens or even hundreds or thousands of different people had ideas for social networks. Um, but ultimately, the economics are that only one of them would dominate. And that could be a matter of uh, um, some unusual circumstances or um, small effects that tilted the balance one way or the other. Um, a slightly better user interface or a key group of influential people who joined, say, Facebook, might ultimately lead it to overtake MySpace. Okay. What are the common mistakes you find businesses make when they're up against platforms which are driving prices down? Well, the thing to understand is that when platforms drive prices down, that it can actually be beneficial for all the participants if they're part of that two-sided network. The uh, I, economics of two-sided networks is very different than uh, traditional economics. And um, having a bigger network with more people participating, lower prices, grows the market quite rapidly. So it's not just the usual downward sloping demand curve. In a way, it's kind of turbocharged. Now, that only helps you if you're part of that two-sided network. It doesn't help if you're competing against it. So um, one of the misconceptions is trying to, to fight the network head-to-head -head versus uh, being part of that platform. Right. Uh, Eric, the way human circumstances work, people just find themselves out of college, out of school, without the right blend of math smarts or without the right blend of technical skills. It's just the way life is. For those people, um, working in today's uh, economy, what are your suggestions? What are you seeing around you? Well, the people I see are most successful are the people who don't simply have math smarts and technical skills, as, as you know, um, but really have a combination of also some of the people and, and softer skills as well. Machines are getting better and better at doing a lot of well-defined, structured tasks, but machines are not very good in two big categories where humans excel. Number one, creativity and large-scale problem identification and solving. So being able to ask the right big questions and figure out creative, out-of-the-box solutions, that's something machines aren't good at. And the second big category is interpersonal skills, uh, connecting with people, motivating, uh, persuading people, leading, selling, uh, caring for people and nurturing people. These are things that we don't usually rely on machines to do either. So I would not um, rule out investing in those kinds of people skills, those kinds of softer skills. And if you can combine technical skills with both creativity and people skills, well, that's a winning combination. That's about people, Eric. What about firms? Many firms continue to do bizarre and counterproductive things, like you yourself say. but their view of the elephant tells them they're doing great. So, right. um, and the processes inside those firms are the hardest things to change. Yes. So, um, how do firms wisen up? When does that happen? At scale? Well, um, it's very hard for big firms to do that. One of the reasons is that startups tend to dominate a lot of these new markets and, and are relatively new firms is that when a new technology comes along, it's hard for an old firm to recognize that it needs to change. 
And what's more, even when some of the people in the firm do recognize it, it takes a coordinated effort of all the different components of the firm to switch. The analogy I sometimes make is suppose uh, you had a, a very nice dig a nice analog watch, uh, you know, maybe it's a Swiss watch, and you wanted to take advantage of digital technologies. Well, it would be a mistake to try to do that piece by piece, uh, open up the back of the watch, move one of the gears, and replace it with a transistor one by one. That would never work. You have to make a coordinated change and have an entirely digital system, or for that matter, an entirely analog system. But mixing and matches pieces of the old system with pieces of the new system rarely, if ever, works. It's the same thing with organizations. It's just not as visible. With the watch, you can see the components. With an organization, the components are business processes and intangible assets. They're customs and incentive systems. They're hiring practices. And each of them has to fit with the other practices. Um, that can be a tall order. Often, no one, no one person in the firm understands how they all fit together. And uh, making a transition, uh, I'd say more firms fail than succeed making that transition, but some do succeed. Sometimes it happens through design, sometimes through luck, I guess. But what are the risks beyond the obvious ones for firms which are not first and not early to change their processes? Well, the risk is that you get stuck halfway. As I said, where you are, may have, you have parts of the organization that have digitized and parts that haven't. And not only don't you get the full benefits, but you actually in some ways could be worse off than if you hadn't got, made these halfway measures. And as you said, no one fully understands all, how all the pieces fit together. So sometimes there's an element of luck in whether you are able to make the right choices. And the invisible hand of the marketplace is one of the ways that in economies we see that transition. Um, we'll see many firms try. Some of them will hit on the right combinations and, and succeed. I think uh, a firm that takes an entrepreneurial approach, that takes a market-driven approach, that is ready to experiment and test is more likely to succeed. So um, rather than sort of try to make a big five-year plan, uh, I think having a number of small all experiments that take advantage of the technology in different ways can often be a, 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 an effective way of making that transition. Eric, there are so many online firms. Uh, basically, online is their platform. They are free. There are no paywalls. Um, and essentially, they're just turbocharging Google Ads or paid search uh, ads to make sure people see them. Uh, right. What happens to these companies? What do you see happening in the future? Lower, um, lower fixed costs, lower staffing, maybe. Um, well, there's, uh, I think, a, a whole spectrum of outcomes, and, and what we're seeing is that we're many of these content markets are looking like they have a, a long tail or Pareto type curve, where there are a few winners and then some medium firms and then a long tail of uh, often very, very small firms filling in niche markets. Look at these in the videos on YouTube. There are a few that have billions of views, over one billion, and then there are many, many that have, uh, have even just a few hundred views. So it's the whole spectrum. That's kind of different than what you see in most uh, industries. Manufacturers are not nearly as, have that same kind of long tail or uh, even retailers. But in digital markets, you have much more of a, a long tail like that. And many of them can be sustained quite effectively with advertising, especially becomes more and more targeted. Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be in that billion view end of the spectrum. You see the same thing in almost every content market now as it becomes digitized. I'll move now from firm and labor questions to slightly larger scale. Uh, more than a dozen countries have released their AI strategies, really, in the last right. 24 months alone. And yes. since you live and work in the U.S., what is your view from what you've seen of the U.S. strategy, at least the latest one? Yeah. Well, so I was at the White House for that meeting, and uh, I'm glad that the U.S. is uh, getting involved. The Obama administration had, uh, had three very good reports on this, so we went in some depth. And now uh, the Trump administration is picking up on some of that work. Um, it is a approach that is fairly market driven and uh, is expecting the private sector to take the lead. And, and fortunately, in the United States, we have uh, a very strong 
private sector. We also have, uh, I think, arguably some of the world's leading universities, uh, like MIT, where I am now, and, and Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon, and many others that are doing outstanding research in these areas. So trying to harness some of those natural advantages is really the core of the U.S. strategy. Um, it's, uh, I'm glad that the other countries are also um, intentionally focusing on this area. Ultimately, as more people, countries, and organizations invest in AI, I think it increases the chances that we'll have breakthroughs that benefit all of humanity. Um, some of them undoubtedly will come up with cures for important diseases or ways of diagnosing cancer that we couldn't have done before. We'll be able to get self-driving cars faster. Uh, we'll have less food waste if we have better predictive systems. And uh, it, it maybe some of those are innovated first in the United States or maybe in China or France or India or elsewhere. Um, but I hope the whole world will benefit from the advances regardless of where they occur. Is immigration policy affecting any of this? Do you want to comment? Immig yeah, um, unfortunately it is affecting in a, in a negative way in the United States. Uh, that was a point I made at the White House meeting was that um, – the United States has been perceived as being more hostile to uh, a lot of high skill immigration than it was in the past, and that's really making it more difficult for my own students to continue to stay here and study and, and work in companies after they complete their PhDs. Um, and it's discouraged, I think, some people from even coming to the United States to begin with. Um, this is obviously a bad thing for the United States to keep the immigrants out. I would make the case that it can be bad for the world as well because. Uh, top researchers benefit when they are working side by side, shoulder to shoulder with other top researchers. And if we make it hard for them to come together in places like MIT and Silicon Valley, um, then I don't think uh, science will advance as rapidly as if we uh, if we have free flow and people can just go and join up forces with wherever they think they can add the most value. A related question on the U.S. You and Dr. McAfee are working on what you call an understudied yet critical issue, digital technologies and their impact on earnings prospects of American workers. What are you finding? Well, what we're finding is that digital technologies are making the pie a lot bigger in the sense that they're creating more wealth than the world has ever seen before. In particular, we see more millionaires and billionaires than ever in human history. But the other side of it is not as good. That is that it's also associated with more inequality. Uh, a lot of people are being left behind. It's that long tail I was describing with a few winners and a long tail of people who are struggling even just to get by. Uh, unfortunately, there's no economic law that says everyone's going to benefit from these advances. It's possible for some people to be left behind. It's even possible, theoretically, for the majority of people to be left behind and the benefits to be concentrated in a very small group, even 1%. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I want to stress that, that these are different kinds of outcomes that are possible. Technology is a tool, and it can be used in many ways. And as we stress in our book, you know, the second machine age, machine platform crowd, uh, these tools can be used to lead to more concentrated wealth, which is the way it's been going for the past about 20 years, or they can be used to create more broadly shared prosperity. Um, in fact, Andy McAfee and I created something we call the Inclusive Innovation Challenge, where we're giving away $1 million to people and organizations that are using technology to create more broadly shared prosperity. Um, we've identified hundreds of uh, organizations that have uh, entered the contest, and uh, in the fall, we will be awarding a $1 million to the organizations that have uh, use technology not just to create wealth and benefits, but to create shared prosperity where many people are participating. Wow, that's something. Um, you know, in your book, the most recent one that sits behind me, actually. Uh, Machine Platform Crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each chapter ends with a bunch of questions. Um, right. Very sharp ones. So one of them is this. If the crowd comes up with a better idea, how will you bring it into the core? It's, it's fundamental to, to how uh, firms prosper. Knowing all that you do, what, what's the secret sauce? Well, you know, a lot of it starts with just recognizing uh, a simple fact. It seems obvious when I say it, but most companies don't understand it. And that is that no matter how many smart people you have in your management, no matter how many smart people you hire, most of the smart people in the world don't work for your company. Most of them are outside your company. And 
almost as important, perhaps more important, um, the people outside your company think different. They have different ways. They don't have the same culture. And when they come at problems, they tend to approach them in a way that um, is more likely to have the solution to some of the things you've really been struggling with for a long time. If you, if you, your top people haven't been able to solve a problem uh, after working with it for a long way, maybe they're looking at the wrong way. And somebody in a different organization or in a different part of the world will see it, and maybe they'll find it. It's very easy to solve. So there are platforms like that, Top Coder, Kaggle, and many others that you can tap into to get these sorts of people. And it requires a change in culture. Uh, people tend to have a, a mentality, sometimes called the not invented here mentality, where they just don't like to look at solutions from outside the company. But if managers want to be successful, they need to change that culture and be willing to take ideas from the outside um, and, uh, and different cultures. Um, and the most successful companies are the ones who have been doing exactly that and then integrated into their organizations. We have a number of examples in the book, I, I, won't, I won't go through them all right now, of just some eye-popping improvements. Um, not just tenfold, but even a hundred or a thousandfold improvement in key processes that companies were able to achieve by tapping into the power of the crowd. Final question, Eric. Um, again, a question from your book itself. If our competitors implemented a successful machine learning system for blank, we'd be in serious trouble. Um, it's my, one of my favorites. Would you say this is the single most important question for any firm to ask itself today? I think it probably is because the great general purpose technology of our era is machine learning, a category of artificial intelligence. And it is now able to do many tasks that previously only humans could do. Um, in uh, a paper we wrote since that book, I wrote a paper with Tom Mitchell called uh, What Can Machine Learning Do? Um, we describe a rubric that describes which kinds of tasks machine learning is good at and which ones aren't. And I think by applying that rubric to your organization, you can see where machine learning can work well. And as we say in that question there, maybe where your competitors are applying machine learning um, and how that might change the economics of your business very, very fundamentally. We've already seen it happen in a number of industries. And uh, there's whatever industry you're in right now, there's no reason to think that you'll be immune. Um, I think that understanding the power of machine learning is the key challenge. Uh, in, in a Harvard Business Review article that Andy and I wrote, I think the last line of that is one I'd like to quote now, which is that uh, machine learning is not going to replace managers, but managers who know how to use machine learning will replace managers who don't. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Good talking to you, Nikki.